Praise the Lord. Let's turn today to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. I hope you have your Bibles. The King James Version, the Authorized Version, the infallible book. Infallible, inerrant, and inspired. The living word, the living God. God preserved his words, for his words are pure words. And he preserved his word in English. In the Authorized Version, let's turn. The Authorized Version is perfect, infallible. There are no mistakes in the Authorized Version. And anyone that hears this message today that says they know a mistake in the Authorized Version, I invite you to message me on YouTube or on my email. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and that which is to come. Bodily exercise profit is little. But the world today would have you think that bodily exercise profit is much, and godliness profit is little. For that's the spirit of the fallen world today. That's the spirit of the cursed world. That the body is more important than the spirit. So they exercise their body. They take many weight gainers and fitness programs, and they love their bodies. They love it. They watch what they eat, they count their calories, they see their sodium intake. They do exercise, thinking that being able to exercise, being strong and fit in their flesh, is what's going to count on the day of judgment. And it won't, for they'll say, Lord, did I take care of my body? But I neglected my soul, and I neglected the souls of those that are around me. For I never preached to the lost that they must be born again in Jesus Christ the Savior, the blessed King of Kings, the only potentate who only hath immortality. For our body, our physical frame is mortal. But Jesus Christ hath only immortality. He is the immortal, the immortal, invisible spirit being, the almighty, the Amen. Jesus Christ says, I am the Amen the faithful and true witness, the first begotten of the dead, King of kings, Lord of lords. That King went to the cross for you. That Lord took the scourge to his back for you. That King of kings, Lord of lords, stood up, condescended himself, came down to earth. Though he was rich, yet he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich rich in the glory that is your born again soul, rich in the knowledge of your eternal soul is going to be in heaven, ultimate paradise, eternal happiness. Because you claim to be a son of the living God. You claim to be born again. You claim to be a child of God. A son. A son of the living God. Jesus Christ has borne you into the new birth, into his kingdom, by the new birth, and you claim to be a child of God. But godliness, godliness is profitable. For there's no such thing as an ungodly child of God. For a child of God is godly. Godliness, for he is godly. For he's God. How can you claim to be a child of God living in sin? How can you claim to be a child of God not preaching to the lost? For he preached to the lost and he is God. And you claim to be his children. You claim to be walking in sin, not able to stop your sin. Not able to overcome by his blood, which cleanses from all sin. Godliness is foreign to you. In fact, godliness is so foreign that when you see others living godly, you even rebuke them in your heart. You even hate them in your heart. 
you even falsely accuse them in your heart and maybe even with your mouth that they're Pharisees, that they're actors, that they're hypocrites. No, friends. Godliness is profitable, not only in the life which is to come, but godliness has the promise of the life that now is. For we were, there are two lives, the life that you now live in the flesh, born of the woman, and the life that is to come, whether it be in heaven or whether it be in hell, fire and damnation, and outer darkness under pressure in the earth where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched in hell with Satan, the adversary, the one who tempts you, the one who says, doth God say? The one who tells you that you can't stop sinning. The one who tells you that you can't live godly. That's only for the saints. That's only for the pastor. That's only for the nuns or the missionaries to live godly. But me, I'm just a lowly old sinner, wallowing in my sin as a swine, but yet claiming to be a child of the living God, claiming to be the offspring of that one who, full of faith, bore his cross, the offspring of the one who, by faith, gave us the promises, who, by faith, took our sins, who, by faith, bore the wrath of an angry God. You claim to be an offspring of his, while you, are wallowing in sin, that secret sin, while you are living ungodly, claiming to be a child of God, living ungodly hypocrite. Ye must be born again. Born again in your spirit. Born again when you come under the conviction of the Holy Ghost that you are not saved, that you are not a child of God, that you have not truly been born again. Have you been born again? Have you had that personal relationship with the living God? Or are you just going to church? For if all you do in your Christian, quote unquote, Christian life is to bless the doors of a church once a week, to walk into a church for an hour and a half once a week, and to sing hymns, and to listen to a pastor preach a 30 minute sermon, or go eat after the sermon and have fellowship with your other Christian friends, and then you walk out that back door of the church, never to bless it again with your holy presence until next Sunday. If that's the kind of Christian life you're living, if that's the kind of Christian who you are, then your faith is dead. You have a dead faith. For we are to be godly, not only in this present world, but that we may inherit the promises of the world to come. For godliness is profitable in this life and in the life that is to come. Two lives, the life in the flesh and the life in the eternal spirit. Will it be in hellfire or will it be in paradise with our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed potentate, the ancient of days, the holy child, the one who walked the burning streets, and the one who came and healed the sick, the one who bore your sins and your griefs and your sorrows, the one who took it all from you and promised you a place in heaven, the one who gave you the down payment of your mansion, the Holy Spirit, the earnest of the promise, that ye being dead to sin might live unto righteousness. For godliness is profitable. Let's turn. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, because we have the promises. Fearing God that we have these great and precious promises of eternal life, and not only the eternal life which is to come, but having the precious promises that godliness is profitable to us in this present life. 
that we can be blessed and happy in serving the Lord, that we can be a child of God without hypocrisy, that we can preach the word to the lost because He preached the word to the lost, that we can love our neighbor as ourselves, that we can glorify the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose face shines like the sun, whose blood is holy and perfect, and whose blood cries out to God that this one is righteous, that this one redeems mankind, that this one made a way for your creature to enter into the Holy of Holies, the heavenly host, and all the angels say, Amen. Blessed be that God. Blessed be the God who is not a God of only words and scriptures and hieroglyphs and scrolls. No, He's a God of action. A God of the living faith. A God of faith and works in godliness. For we have these promises. And because we have these promises, the promises of eternal life, then we should cleanse ourselves. Let's see what it says again. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. For God is great terrible, mighty, and fearful, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Who is this one that cometh from Bozra, with his dark garments dipped in blood? The one who is mighty to save, mighty to save, and mighty to cast down strongholds of the enemy, which is Satan, who tells you you can't be saved. Satan who tells you you can't live godly. Satan who tells you you can't stop sinning. Satan who tells you it's only your pastor's job to serve the Lord. It's only your senior evangelist's job to go out and win the lost. It's only your missionary's job to go to the lost in the foreign countries. It's only the deacon's job to take care of the widows. No, it's your job as a child of God. You being a child of God claiming that title are to live godly in the fear of God. Why do we have to fear God, preacher? Because if we don't fear God, then we won't obey God. And if we don't obey God, we won't keep His commandments. And if we don't keep His commandments, we will not have right to the tree of life. As it is written, Blessed are they that keep His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and that they may enter into the gates into the city. The tree of life. I used to sing about it when I was a young Jewish boy. It is the tree of life to them that hold fast to it. It is the tree of life to them that hold fast to it. And all of its supporters are happy. The tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. The tree of life, the branch, the one that you need to be a part of, grafted in. Grafted in to His holy presence in the life to come. And in this life, through godliness. Let's turn. Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1. Verse 3. Second Peter 1, 3. According to his according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to His glory and virtue. Let's read it again. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, a child of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. A child of God has escaped the corruption which is in the world through lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of things, the lust of a position and power, 
the lust of the praise of men, the lust of women, the lust of all these things, pornography, alcohol, drugs, lust. But ye, a child of God, have escaped these things, having been a partaker of the divine nature, being born again, overcoming by his blood, which cleanses from all sin. Because we have the promises, not only for this life, but for the life to come. For living godly in this life, I have to testify to you, is a great, great blessing. And it's humbling. It's humbling to think that God in heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Holy One, would call and command this preacher to stand and preach as the only one that does it in Washington, D.C., in this sinful and adulterous generation. Something's bad wrong, friends, if I have to go out there and preach, if I'm the only one standing on the corner, if you see rainbow flags hanging from churches, if you see lesbians as pastors, if you see all these things, know this, that the Son of Man is coming soon. For as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes in glory with all the angels of God, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, full of pride. That's how it'll be. And he'll come that quick. And he'll snatch us out of here. We who are alive and remain, those of us who are godly in Christ Jesus, being a partaker of his divine nature, not those of us who are living in sin, drunkenness, surfeiting, saying the Lord delayeth his coming, not looking for the blessed hope, no, they'll be left behind. They'll be left behind when he comes and these are the last days. When you start to see these signs, the fig tree blossoming, Israel becoming a nation, the armies of the world gathered together against her, as it, is, as it was in the days of Noah. The Noah, when he entered into the ark, a preacher of righteousness, and nobody listened. When preachers start to preach to you righteousness and no one's listening, when they're hoisting up rainbow flags everywhere, because the sign that God gave to Noah was a rainbow, that he would not destroy the earth with a flood, because the next time he's coming with fire, he's coming with brimstone, and he's going to melt the elements with the fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up, dissolved, melted, mountains melting, faces melting, men seeking for death and not being able to find it, for it will be a supernatural time after he comes. For now we're living in this life, which is a natural life. Now we're living in this flesh, which is a natural flesh. But the time is going to come, whether it be when you die, when you cast off your mortal frame, that you'll be from then on in a supernatural position. Or it'll be a supernatural world if you don't die and he comes again from the time that he comes again, from that moment when he shines from the east to the west, like lightning, the day of Christ, the day when everyone is weeping and wailing, woe unto us, for today is the day of the Lamb and who is able to bear it? hide us from the face of the Lamb, who is able to bear his wrath from that day on. When the Son of Man returns as a thief, it will be a supernatural time, and you won't be able to die, even though you'll be seeking for death. The suffering will be so great, men will seek for death and will not find it. And you'll accept the mark of the beast, and you'll worship the Antichrist for food. And if you don't, you'll be killed. For whosoever does not accept that mark of the beast shall be put to death. Some people say that we're living in the tribulation today, which is not true. For in the tribulation all the green grass will be burnt up, and I'm standing on green grass now. In the tribulation men will have to receive the mark of the beast to buy and sell, and those who don't will be put to death. Are you being put to death right now for your social security number? Are you being put to death right now for your microchip and your credit card? No, you're not. But in that supernatural time, when you have to accept the mark of the beast, you will be put to death if you refuse it. But then you'll be saved. For now we live in the age of grace, where you can be saved through faith, 
through his grace and his mercy. But when he returns, there is no more grace. There is only martyrdom for salvation. Let's turn. Let's turn. And many today, Christians professing, say they don't want Jesus to come back. I'm sure they don't. But if you're like us, if you're like me, if you're like all those who look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, we love his appearing. We're waiting for him to come back. We want him to return right now, this instant. You say, I don't want him to come back. And you don't know the Lord and you don't love him. Well, he's only going to come back for those who love his appearing. Well, I want my daughter to be saved and preach the gospel to her immediately. I don't want all these sinners to go to hell. Go out and preach the gospel to them. Living godly. Let's turn. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse sixteen. Second Corinthians six sixteen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Next verse, having therefore these promises, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, so that we may be the children of God. For he will be our God, and we will be a child unto him, and he will be a father unto us. If we come out from among them, and be ye separate, not living in the filthiness and the uncleanness of the flesh, but being separate. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Are you a child of God? Are you cleansed from your sin? For if you are not, and you are not living godly, then you cannot claim to be partner, you cannot claim to be the offspring, you cannot claim to be yoked with, you cannot claim to be connected to, you cannot claim to be anything with that who is holy, godly, for he is God and we are to be godly. Godliness is great and profitable, not only in this life, but in the life which is to come because we have these promises of eternal life. Let's turn. Second Thessal excuse me, First Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God hath not called us unto uncleanness. No, He has not. He has called us unto holiness. And the next verse is for you that despise the words that I'm preaching today. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. The Lord is holy, holy, holy. And you, as a professed child of God, are to live godly, godly, godly. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm mixing two verses there, but bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is great gain. Let's turn. Let's turn. Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Peter. Well, let me just double check here. 
1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Let's read it again. 1 Peter 2, 21. Christ is our great example. For even, unto, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. For Christ is our great example. Read it one more time. Verse 21, 1 Peter 2, 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. Are you following the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you living in sin, deceived by the devil and unrighteousness, hating, lying, cheating, trying to get ahead in business through deceit, loving money, coveting after those things of the earth which give you glory unto men? For if I please men, and I would not be a servant of God, are you rich? Are you gathering up much things that you may eat and drink, take your rest, be merry, and you are not rich toward God? You are not godly. You are not living godly in this present time, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And the Bible says, Even so, Amen. So be it. Even so, Jesus Christ, come. If you're not right with God, get right with God. If you're not ready for Him to come, get ready, because He's coming. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be when He comes. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back. Remember Lot's wife. She loved the things of this earth. She loved the sin of Sodom. She loved Sodom. Sodom was destroyed. Are you a lover of Sodom? Or are you a lover of God? Is your conversation in heaven? Or do you mind earthly things? Are you living godly as Christ being your example? Claiming to be a child of God but living in sin? Let's turn to see if you really are living as Christ for your example. First Peter, let's turn to Matthew. Matthew 10, 38. Matthew 10, 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me, said Jesus. Christ suffered, left us an example. He didn't mind the earthly things of this world because he was a believer. He believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He believed that there was a paradise waiting for him and all those who would come after him, who believed in him and his work on the cross, who took his blood for the cleansing of their sin, who put on his grace, who lived their lives after his example, who received the grace of God inside them, not as unmerited favor, no, but by grace are we saved. His grace, the grace of the King that causes us to follow His example in godliness. He that taketh up not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me, saith the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn to John 12:25. John chapter 12, verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it, 
And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. The disciples asked Jesus Christ, Lord, increase our faith. And he gave them this lesson. He told them, which one of you having a servant? Who's out? I'm going to paraphrase. He told them, which one of you having a servant? After they asked him to increase their faith. His disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. And he said, which one of you having a servant out in the field plowing or milking the cattle? When it was time to eat, would call that servant in and tell him to sit down and feed himself and gird himself and eat and drink and then serve you. No, you wouldn't. But you would tell your servant to sit down. Or excuse me, you would tell your servant to serve you first. And after you had eaten and drunken, then could the servant sit and eat when you were finished, he says. I'm paraphrasing. And he says that that servant should not say into it in his heart that he had some kind of a glory. No, he should say that he was an unprofitable servant and that he had done that which it is his duty to do. Increase our faith, the disciples asked. And he said to do your duty. For when you do your duty, your faith will be increased. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And faith without works is dead. Whereas the body without the spirit is dead, a dead carcass. So also faith without works is dead. Increase our faith, Lord, they said. He said, serve. Serve, he said. Let's turn. John 12, 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You profess to know God, but in works you deny him. Because you won't serve. There's that little voice inside you. That when you even do want to serve, that little voice whispers and tells you don't do it. I will not serve. That voice is Satan. For Jesus Christ commands. He wants servants. The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. For hell is real. Jesus Christ called hell a place of fire. Hell fire, he called it, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In the earth, a spiritual place, not a natural place, for there is a natural and there is a spiritual, and the spiritual is invisible to the natural eye. But it's there, friend. It's there. For when I was born again, that invisible spirit came into the room. And he let me know that at that moment, he had taken my sins from me. And he had placed them on his shoulders on the cross. And that invisible God began to communicate with me. And that invisible God cleansed my soul. I received the joy of salvation. And I knew that God was truly real. Not only was God real, the God that I'd made up in my mind, no, not that God, friends. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the real God. And He sends His Holy Spirit to convict you. And unless you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, you cannot be born again. For except the man be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can only enter the kingdom of God after you've been born again. The Holy Spirit convicts you that you have not been born again. Look at your life. Look at how you refuse to serve. Look at how you wallow in sin. Look at how you have no victory. You have not truly believed. And that Holy Spirit will convict you. 
and you'll cry out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you believe with your heart, and it's been a true belief, then God will manifest himself to you. And he'll give you the witness of the Holy Spirit, and the burden will be lifted, the sins will be forgiven, and you'll know that you've been promised those great and precious promises. Let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And you'll have the true faith. We see the halls of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to read through all of it, but we'll go to verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Now listen to this. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves in the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, they without us should not be made perfect. Imagine all of that, all those fathers in the faith in the Old Testament. They all went through all of that and they received not the promise of the coming of the Lord. They received not the true word, the way, the truth, and the life. They didn't have the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. God had not condescended down to them in the flesh yet. And after they've been through all of that, and they obtained a good report with God through their faith, they still did not receive the promise. But we have received that better promise, which is Jesus Christ and His new covenant. The precious promise where we can know that we're going to heaven. For the Jews, me being raised as a Jew, were never sure whether they'd go to heaven. They weren't even sure whether there was a heaven. Some believe that there was all there was was this earth, as that would be the line of the Sadducees who believe there is no resurrection. Then you have the line of the Pharisees who believe that there was a resurrection, but that there was not any type of a heaven. It would just be a earthly resurrection and they'd be with God, but they didn't know, they didn't have the heaven laid out and spell it out for them like Jesus laid it out for us. But Jesus and the apostles they laid out and spelled out what heaven's going to be like. Streets of gold. A new Jerusalem. Rivers of waters. A throne with a rainbow around it. Creatures. Elders. White robes. A lamb. Spotless and sinless. Who would be the lamb that we would all worship and sing praises to for all eternity. And God would wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we can know even how big heaven is, for it's been measured. But they didn't have those promises, but we do. That's why they write that we have the precious promises. And we know where we're going. And because we know these promises, that we should pass our sojourning here with fear, that we may not inherit that blessing, that we may fall, that we may fall from the faith through the deceitfulness of unrighteousness that we may say in our hearts I will not obey the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ I do not love him 
He that loveth me keepeth my commandments. Let's turn. Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. This is speaking about Jesus. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. But he has, and he says, Whosoever shall take, taketh up not his cross, and followeth not after me, is not worthy of me, striving unto blood, resisting sin. Nope, you haven't done it. You have not done it. You have not taken up your cross. You have not preached to the lost. You have disobeyed the commandments of the Lord. You have not done what it is your duty to do. Let's turn. And the Bible describes that as not loving God. Not loving Him enough. Not loving that one. Not loving the Christ. Not loving Jesus Christ, who's our example who gives us commands and warnings and exhortations that he that taketh up not his cross followeth not after me is not worthy of me. Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, running a race, we're warring a war, we're to be soldiers of Christ, warring a good warfare, as Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, this is not a joke, and if you think it's a joke, you're not saved, you don't believe in the supernatural, you don't take it seriously, you don't consider your neighbor that they're going to go burn in hell forever, you don't consider the lost. You don't consider the Lord and His commandments. You don't consider the Lord and His exhortations and the exhortations of the apostles. You don't consider the warnings to live in fear of God, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You don't consider the warnings that Satan walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he takes them captive at his will. You don't put on the armor of God, the breastplate of, breastplate of faith, the helmet of salvation. You don't walk in the way. You don't walk in the way. Let's turn. James chapter 1. James 1 verse 12. James 1 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The Lord hath promised the crown of life to them that love him. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus says. Let's turn. James, chapter 2. Excuse me, James, chapter 5. Verse 2. Excuse me. James chapter, let me find it, well, let's go on, let's go to 1st Timothy, I'll close with 1st Timothy chapter 6, 1st Timothy chapter 6. I'm sorry, let's go to James, I found it. James chapter 2, verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? And then we go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. 
I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And Timothy did. Timothy did fight the good fight. Timothy did war a good warfare. Timothy, the bishop of Ephesus, was willing to communicate the gospel. Timothy had no part in idols, no part with the heathen. There are Christians today who would have you not preach to the heathen. When I was in Bangkok, they would come up to us and rebuke us and say, leave the heathen alone. The heathen are on their way to hell. Christians telling us to not preach to the heathen. Christians telling us that they're already saved and grabbing us, grabbing at our camera. Christians cursing at us when we offer them tracks. These are not the Christians that will be caught up if they do not repent. The Christians who look for that blessed hope, for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ones who are doing their duty because they've received the grace of God. And by His grace, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly and holy in this present time, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Timothy, tradition has it as an old man, when he saw the Ephesians bringing out their idols to the goddess Diana, when they were marching down the, the main street, Timothy as an old man, warring a good warfare, went out and stood in front of them all and pleaded with them to not be a worshiper of this goddess Diana, for she would lead to hell, but to worship the true and living God and to believe the gospel. Timothy preached the gospel to them. And he was martyred because he took up his cross and he loved not his life unto the death. And I pray, you'll pray, that God would give you that kind of a grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.